um, Bishop David said just before lunch um, struck me as worth expanding on a little bit. He quoted Augustine and Teresa. And I think it's important that we realise that the Gospels emerged out of Christian experience. So when Augustine you know, has an experience of God that just totally changes, opens his life, or when it's Teresa, it's that experience of God that begins everything. And so the first experience of God for these communities, of course, was the living Jesus. And then that experience continued in the resurrection, ongoing experience of Jesus alive. In pondering, what is it that we are experiencing? How can we name it? That's when you get words. So people tried to talk about what it was that they were experiencing. And they obviously experience joy, thanksgiving, delight, something new. They called it good news, good news. So the words, now once you start putting words on your experience of God, you're doing theology. So that's the next step. These early Christian communities are making connections between their experience and what they know about God and using God language, uh, language that uh, we find in these scriptures of Israel to try and say, ha, ah, that's what we're experiencing. We're experiencing a new covenant or we're experiencing the Holy Spirit being poured into our hearts. So it begins so with an experience and then finding the language to put on the experience. Eventually, the gospel writers take the theology, what they've learnt, the words they've been using, the thinking that's been going on, and the gospels reflect that in a story or we might say a narrative. And the narrative focuses on, on Jesus, but it's much more than just the remembered events. It's the Jesus story that flows out of their ongoing experience. Did Jesus experience by some of them when, they, when he was alive before the crucifixion but it's also continued through that experience of Jesus alive with them right now and the words and the thinking about what does it mean but I think it's important that we see the Gospels develop out of an experience and sometimes we can get a bit lost when we're trying to read the Gospels and think, oh, what's it all mean? I don't understand it, da 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 But if we can try and get a sense of, look, these are real human beings, like me, who had an experience of God in Jesus, and they struggled to put words on it. Uh, they, they did the best they could. The words they found the most helpful came from their Jewish background. Later on, church words, as people sort of lost touch a bit with the Judaism, the Jew Jewish background, they looked for other words and they, they found some helpful words in Greek philosophy. So later on, we turned more to philosophy. But all the time, we're trying to put words on what is God doing in our lives? 
whether it's early in, t in the story, and so we have the Gospels, or whether it's later the creeds. Always they're an attempt to put words on our experience. And no words really adequately capture the experience. It's always, this is good and there's so much more. So I just thought um, it's helpful to reflect on the sense of experience as well as story. I, I also wanted to tell you a little story. <laughs> Again, something uh, David said reminded me of this, about seeing, and what Frank was doing too, about having the eyes to see. Uh, one of the sisters said in my community uh, teaches little kids, you know, pre-preps, that age level, five, six-year-olds. And she asked this little fellow one time, where did dead people go? What happens to dead people? And this little guy says, oh, they go to live with God. Yeah, that's good. So Helen says, but you told me God is all around us. Yeah, that's right. So. Does that mean the dead people are all around us? And this little guy says, yeah, that's right. And Helen says, but so why can't we see them? And she says, and the little fellow says, because we're not dead yet. <laughs> I thought, wow. <laughs> what about that? You know, <coughs> there's a whole reality <coughs> that we don't see because we're not dead yet. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I, I think there's great truth in that. All right. But today, or this, right now, we're going to look at the hour. The hour that this gospel has been moving for, the hour where we get all the answers. They all happen. Our Agatha Christie novel is coming to its end. All the clues. So on the top of page 76, I've just reminded you of some of these clues. One of the clues was found in the prologue. He came to his own. Aista idea. And his own received him not. But those who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the power to become the children of God. That's what we were told. We haven't seen it yet, but we were told it. Second clue, the prologue. The word became flesh, enters into mortality, and tabernacled among us. Not just lived, but the use of the word that captures the Old Testament word for the tabernacle. Okay, then the second clue, Cana, chapter 2, O oh woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Well, now the hour has come. Now that relationship between Jesus and his mother is going to be critical. Basically, he's, he's saying back at Cana, look, our relationship it's not important right now. Wait till the hour. Well, now we're in the hour. That relationship is critical. John 2, the temple scene. Take these things out. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. And then saying, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. Followed by the response of the Jews, it has taken 46 years to build it. You're going to raise it up in three days. And the narrator telling us, he spoke of the temple of his body. And to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Rather enigmatic sayings, 
But now we're going to see how the cross makes sense of them. So I want you to have a look at your text because it's really important you see what the words are and sometimes I'm going to say those words are not right. That's not what the Greek says. So get your biros ready to put in some other words. And it begins. Chapter 18, verse 1. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden. Now, Catholics are really good at mixing up the Gospels into a dog's breakfast. In the Rosary, we say the agony in the garden. Nonsense. Only Luke uses the word agony. And only John uses garden. So we've mixed up two Gospels. So forget about agony in the garden. But think of it, when you hear the word garden, you're into John. Mark says he went into the uh, Gethsemane. Just Gethsemane. Doesn't call it a garden. Gethsemane. Matthew does the same. Luke, because he, he realises his, his audience won't know what Gethsemane means, calls it Mount Olives. But John says there was a garden. Here it is. Oopsie do, I'm still rubbing it out. Garden. I'm pushing the wrong thing. Oh, I'm still pushing the wrong thing. Start again, Mary. There we go. Here it is. Now turn to chapter 19. Verse 41. 19. Now there was a garden in the place where Jesus was crucified and in the garden there was a new tomb which no one had ever been laid. So... It ends in a garden. These are John's instructions. If you want to paint this scene, here's the background. It begins in a garden, it ends in a garden. What's the most important garden in the Bible? Eden. Eden, Eden. right. The first original garden of creation. Now have a look at John 19. So it's chapter 19, verse 18. And this is one of those where the translators haven't done a very good job. 18. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, and the Greek says, with Jesus in the middle. En meso. In the middle. So here they are, here's the cross. Now, think in terms of the Garden of Creation, the Garden of Eden. What was in the middle of that garden? Tree, Tree of life. life, correct. Tree of life. Okay, Genesis, Tree of Life. I've been looking for a some of you, many of some of you might have had it. There's a magnificent church in Rome, the Church of San Clemente. And above the uh, altar, they have a magnificent uh, mosaic of the cross as a tree of life. Um, if any of you have got a photo of it, please send it to me. <laughs> so there we go. The cross as a tree of life. What's John doing? He's telling the crucifixion story as a creation story. It's in the text. And if you have a look at John 19.25, we get two people in this garden standing at the foot of the cross. Two of them are emphasised. The mother of Jesus and the disciple. Okay? Just have a read of it. We've got a list of a few women and then the mother of Jesus and the disciple are singled out. So I'm going to draw them. Here we go, a mother, 
and the disciple. You could draw them too because it can be helpful. Now, again, notice the way John names this person, the woman. Uh, we're first of all told, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother. And then when Jesus speaks to her, he calls her woman, which is just the same as we had back at Cana. So she is woman and mother. Does that sound like anybody you know? Who? Eve. Eve. Right. This, these are the words or the names given to Eve back in that original garden. We hear when God draws forth the, the woman from the side of Adam. Adam says, here at last, bone is my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman woman and later on after the sin story he renames her from now on she'll be called mother of the living or in Hebrew Eve so this this woman and mother language as well as the whole depiction the geography of John's crucifixion draws on the Genesis creation story which suggests that John's thinking about the cross is in terms of creation new creation you're with me so far because you've never heard this before Okay, so, so, so do stay with me on this. But notice, I'm not pulling it out of my sleeves. Got no rabbits. It's all in the text. It begins in a garden, ends in a garden. The cross is placed in the middle of the garden. At the foot of the cross, a man and a woman, a woman who's only named woman and mother. Right, none of that I've made up. That's what the text actually says. Okay, let's do a little bit more looking at what the text says. Now, Jesus, when he saw his mother, so I'm looking here at verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, Behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. Okay? So now, I'm going to just draw that. Right, John uses words. I'm going to draw it. There it is. He's basically changed these relationships to mother and son. Hasn't he? Okay, that's what's going on. But there's another relationship of mother and son also here at the cross and it's this one. This one. Jesus and this woman are also mother and son. We know that. And now John wants us to do some work for ourselves by drawing the third arrow. If these now both look to this woman and the relationship is mother and son, what does this make this relationship? They must now be brothers. Mm -hmm. And if we wanted to make it inclusive, we'll put sisters too. This is the moment in the gospel when the relationship between Jesus and disciples is changed. 
disciples become brothers, sisters to Jesus. It's not magic. It's what does the text say. It's in the change of relationships. And if disciples are now brothers and sisters of Jesus, what's their relationship with God? They are now children. This is the moment when the narrative tell actually shows us what the prologue promised. Those who believed in his name, he gave them the power to become children of God. This is what's being created here. Children of God. No longer disciples, but children. Now, leaping ahead just momentarily, have a look at chapter 20, verse 17. And look at what the risen Jesus says to Mary. Chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus says to her, that's to Mary Magdalene, Do not touch me. Do not, I'd say, touch. Because I've not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my <coughs> brothers. And because it's plural, we can say brothers and sisters. He no longer calls them disciples. He doesn't say, go to my disciples. He says, go to my brothers and sisters and say to them, I am ascending to my father and now your father. Can you see it in the text? I am ascending to my father and your father. That is amazing. This is the scene where disciples become the children of God. Some of you are looking at me as if I've just pulled 17 rabbits out of hats. <laughs> it's in the text. I hope you can see it there. This is what this scene is all about. It's about disciples drawn into Jesus' own relationship with God. That's what we were told was going to happen. Now, let's go back to our Bibles. Verse 27. Ch ch sorry, chapter 19, verse 27. He said to the disciple, here is your mother, and then we're told, and from that hour, follow the text, the disciple took her, and now we get that phrase again. Ace ta idea. The phrase that was used in John 1.11. He came to his own. And his own did not receive him, but those who did receive him, he gave them the power to become the children of God. Same phrase, linking these two scenes. And look how the translators have messed it up for us. Look at what your Bible says. Yours probably says, and from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. Yeah. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. <laughs> this is the high point of the gospel, people. After this, Jesus says, everything is now finished. Please do not tell me. The whole point of John's gospel is to say, would you look after me, Mum? <laughs> you know, take her home, pink fluffy slippers, sherry, she likes a dressing gown, and yet that's how we've understood this scene. As if now from the cross, the last words of the dying Jesus are simply look after Mum. That is absolute nonsense. This is, the, this is what this scene is all about. 
partly it's, it's, it's been done by bad translations. They've added a word that's not in the Greek. The word home is simply is not there. So they've added it because they haven't understood it. Translators are not theologians. Okay, so from that hour the disciple took her ace ta idea, looked back to where we were first used the phrase and it's about becoming children of God. That's what this is about. That disciples are brought into Jesus' own relationship with God. Now take a moment, have a little buzz because you've never heard that before unless you've read my books. <laughs> so, but only a minute. Okay, let's keep going. Now, you remember when I did the prologue with you I took you back to the opening chapter of Genesis and we had a look and showed that the, the structure is very similar except John's Gospel did not have a seventh day. Remember doing that yesterday? Okay. And I said to you because John's running with a theology of ongoing creation. And it's only now, chapter 19 verse 20, now we hear the language of being finished, which is the language used of God back in Genesis. After this, Jesus knew that all was now finished. And to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I am thirsty. There's the, the jar of vinegar, the sponge lifted up on a branch of hyssop. With time, we'll look at what that's about. And then Jesus says, it is finished. Bowed his head, gave over. Now again, the translator here says his spirit. It's not. It says the spirit in Greek. He handed over the spirit. T-H-E. If you want to capitalise spirit, capitalise it. It's not simply saying Jesus died. This is the moment when that spirit is given. And then we're told the very next day was the Sabbath. Yeah. Now, see, back in Genesis, we have God's creative activity going on. On the sixth day of that creative activity, oopsie do, squeeze that thing again, we get the creation of men and women, male and female. Oops, put it there. And then we said God rested and we have the Sabbath. In John we don't have a Sabbath in the prologue. It's not until now we can get the great Sabbath. And the text actually says it was a great Sabbath. So this marvellous scene of disciples becoming the children of God, the announcement, it is finished, followed by the great Sabbath. The great Sabbath. This is a creation moment, a creation moment. Now we heard of, to, to Nicodemus, Jesus spoke about being reborn. Okay, well this is where he shows they're reborn, not simply as human people, but caught up in the very life of God. Whole new ball game, whole new type of person is possible. Um, lots of other things are happening here at the cross. I think again I'd just like to take a minute because I want to move to another theme that's here but I don't want you to lose that one because lots of things are all going to get interwoven here. So that's one, the whole creation theme. So again just, just a little break, have a little pause and think about it. We see this theme 
And I don't want to do anything much on John 20 because Frank's doing that next, the whole resurrection story. But one tiny aspect of John 20 I want you to take notice of. And it's chapter 20, verse 26. It's the reading we had this morning. And chapter 20, verse 26 says, there we go, well what it should say is eight days later and chapter 20 begins on the first day. <coughs> We're talking about what we call the Sunday. <laughs> Remember the Jewish week, seven days. That's the first creation. God rested on the seventh day. So the next day could be called either the first day and it could also be called the eighth day. And what happens, what we find in the early church and in Judaism at this time, the language of the eighth day takes on a meaning. It takes on the meaning of, as the beginning of the new creation. The first creation was a seven day creation. The new creation starts on the eighth day day, the beginning of the new creation. And I've given a little passage on, on your page where we find this in some early Christian writing. Uh, where did I see it? Top of, page. Top of page 78. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. So this is a piece of writing that isn't in our Christian canon now. Sometimes in the early manuscripts it used to get in, but ultimately it wasn't collected as part of the canon. Called the Epistle of Barnabas, and it says, he further says to them, your new moons and Sabbaths I disdain. Okay, quoting the scriptures. Consider what he means. Not the Sabbaths of the present era are acceptable to me, but that which I have appointed to mark the end of the world and to usher in the eighth day, that is, the dawn of another world. And this, by the way, is the reason why we joyfully celebrate the eighth day, the same day on which Jesus rose from the dead after which he manifested himself and went up to heaven. People, you and I are eighth day people. We're people of the eighth day, the new creation. And, and, and we, when did this happen for us? Think in terms of your local church. This theology, I think we forgot in our tradition, except in our architecture. Many church baptism fonts and baptistries have retained this theology. A theology of the eighth day. And I've got some pictures there of some baptism fonts. The one on the top left comes from Bethlehem. And it's got eight sides. The one uh, on the right is from our convent in Wagga eight sides and the one underneath I just pinched off Google <laughs> eight sides and some of you have been to Florence eight sides uh, somebody was talking, Frank you were talking to me about Oakland the new cathedral there, well when I looked at the baptism at first I was a bit disappointed because it's got a whole pool and I happened to be though with a priest who was an architect and he said Mary look at the roof and there are eight lights in the roof. So that rem somehow the architectural memory is that 
connection between baptism and the eighth day. You and I are plunged into the waters of death and we rise reborn as children of the eighth day a new creation a creation centered on the risen one and if that's not a cause for joy and excitement i don't know what is okay so th that's who we are that's our identity we are eighth day people living in the new creation that has begun hasn't yet been brought to its fulfillment but it is in process eighth day people I find that really exciting <laughs> okay one of the other themes unique to John so again if we go back to chapter 18 is the title given to Jesus on the cross and it starts in chapter 18 so we get the band of soldiers verse 3 coming with the chief police and the priests the Pharisees and Jesus knowing everything that was to happen came forward and said who are you looking for and they said and your text has got it wrong but we do say it correctly on Good Friday because on Good Friday we usually say Jesus the Nazarene and that's what it should be not Jesus of Nazareth but Jesus the Nazarene oops didn't do it let's go now okay the, oh, here we go again the Nazarene and then because John knows that sometimes we need to be hit over the head to really get something they all fall to the ground in astonishment uh, and he says again who are you looking for and once again they say Jesus the Nazarene Jesus responds with the great ego Amy I am but we've heard that title now twice Jesus the Nazarene and the next time we hear it is in John 19 so have a look chapter 19 verse 19 and it says Pilate also had now the next word I'm going to write it on the board now you look at what it says in Greek and you'll be able to read it it says this what does that look like to you why the translators didn't write title I'll never know they call it an inscription when it's actually a title a title Mark calls it an inscription Matthew calls it a charge and Luke also calls it an, or a notice but in, in John it's called a title and this is the title Jesus dies under Jesus the Nazarene the King of the Jews so it's a unique title in John we don't get it in the other Gospels even though most of our Christian crosses have got I-N-R-I but really the I-N, Jesus the Nazarene, is only found in the Gospel of John. You with me? Yes. Haven't gone to sleep? No. no? Good. Okay. Why am I raving about this? The Nazarene. Where does it come from? Once again, it takes us back to a passage in the Old Testament that talks about Anedza. Remember, Hebrew doesn't have vowels. And the passage is, and I've got it on your sheet here, page 78. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesse's the father of King David. And a branch. 
that is a nedza, shall grow out of his roots. So this branch <coughs> in Isaiah comes from the same Hebrew root as the word Nazarene. Got that with me? Okay, so Nazarene is related to the word for a branch. Okay, Hebrew. Now, something else that's really wonderful in the Old Testament is we find in the prophet Zechariah where he names a man with the name Branch. Let's look at it. He's talking about the people coming out of exile and he says take from them here it's on your page take from them silver and gold and make a crown set it on the head of Joshua the son of Jehozadak the high priest and say to him thus says the Lord of hosts behold the man Anyone recognize that phrase? Mm. Yes. Yeah, who says it? Pilate. Pilate, right. That's exactly what Pilate says in John's Gospel. Behold the man. In other words, go back and read the last time you heard this in Zechariah. <laughs> so an illusion. Behold the man whose name is the branch. For he will grow up in his place and look at what the branch is going to do. He will build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord. So this name, the Nazarene, the Nedza, is the branch. And we've just been told this is the name of the one who's going to be a temple builder. That's why Jesus has given this title in John. Because that's exactly what John has Jesus saying back in the temple in John 2. Remember the Jews come and said, give us a sign for, for, for overturning the tables and throwing out the animals and Jesus said destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up then he spoke of the temple of his body here on the cross one temple is being destroyed the temple of Jesus body at the same time Jesus the Nazarene the temple builder branch is raising a new temple let's take that in that's what that sign means this is where Jesus is building or raising up a new temple no one's gone to sleep on me yet have you now be careful here don't lose it. Don't just hang in with me. You see, one of the things again with John is all the clues he's been giving us. Back in John 2, Jesus called the temple, he renamed it. Do you remember what he called it back in 2? He said, stop making my father's house. My father's house. So Jesus has renamed the temple my father's house. You know, in the Old Testament, if you said my father's house, they wouldn't think a building. They'd think you were talking about people. They'd think you were talking about the people who were part of the household. So my father's house is a way of referring to the people the wife or wives, the children, the slaves, the grandchildren, future generations. So this language of my father's house, oops, I've done it again. Uh, but. Uh, 
I like to call at this point my father's house hold. To give the sense that we've, we've shifted away from a building, the temple building where God dwells, to the person of Jesus, and now to a wider community, people who make up the Father's house hold. <laughs> the temple, the household of the Father. I'm asking you to hold quite a few things together. This is the beauty, the artistry of the gospel. Lots of layers coming together. Who are the people of these father's household? Well, hasn't it just been created at the foot of the cross when disciples become children of God? Therefore, part of the household of God. The household of God. This is where it's created here. This is why John can conceive of this crucifixion as more than just a political event, but his reading of it is in this event disciples become the children of God, part of the Father's household. And John creates this extraordinary narrative to bring out that theological insight. When I say create, you realise Paul had already said a lot of this. Paul had already said to the, uh, you know, the early uh, Christian community, don't you know you are a temple of God? The Spirit of God lives in you? Uh, don't you know you are God's children and you can call Abba Father? So this language of the, uh, the early Christians being able to call God Abba Father or think of themselves as a living temple, none of that's new. But what John has done is drawn it together in telling the story of Jesus. He's taken the theology and shaped it into a narrative, a particular way of telling the Jesus story. With me? Okay. Again, th this is my work. <laughs> Frank knows this is what I did my doctorate on, okay, under Frank's supervision. So if you're sitting there thinking, God, I've never heard this before, well, of course you haven't. <laughs> you know, this is new research, new uh, interpretation, but I hope I've shown you that it's not make-believe. It's actually seeing what is in the text. Uh, tracing it back to its Old Testament allusions. And yes, it is new. I hope I'm making you move away from thinking the main point of John's Gospel is Jesus saying, look after me mother. <laughs> that's, that's just so silly. It just completely trivialises the Gospel. There are many other themes in the Passion lots of other themes. There's the theme of Jesus as the new Passover lamb. I want to just continue though with the theme of the temple a little bit. Um, have a look at John 19 And it's the scene where Jesus' side is pierced. Got that? Okay, instead one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once blood and water came out. Various possibilities for this 
what might lie behind this. Piercing of the side of Jesus. I can think of three. There might even be more. But these are the three that I think of. One of them is a birth image. That with the birth of a child, there is a flow of blood and water. And here at the cross, disciples are born again as children of God. Born of the spirit that Jesus breathes upon them. So that's a possibility. Another possibility is temple language. Because if you think about it, what's going on in the temple on this day, which John has, is the day getting ready for Passover. This is the day when people are bringing their lambs into the temple to the priests to be slaughtered. So imagine what's going on. You have thousands and they are all bringing their lambs. The first one group from about midday. Those lambs are killed, skins wrapped up, blood drained, out they go. Next lot come in. Lambs are killed, uh, wrapped up, taken home to eat. What do you think the temple looks like by the end of that day? Absolutely covered in the blood of all the sacrificial lambs. So what do you think the priests are doing at the end of the day? Washing it out, of course. So out of the side of the temple is literally flowing blood and water. So it's possible that this too, of the blood and water flowing from the side of Jesus, is also a reference to what's going on on the other side of Jerusalem at the, in the temple. So two possibilities there. That one possibility is a birth image. We do find that picked up in some of the early uh, Greek fathers of the church. The other possibility is the temple imagery still flowing through this scene. Now, I want to move from scripture to saying a little tiny bit, and I, I think might like to continue on this. You see, the early church, a Greek church, and this the oh, well, Jewish moved into the Greco-Roman world. This understanding of the meaning of Jesus' death is that we become children of God that understanding did continue in the early Greek fathers of the church they called it theosis becoming godlike that we are drawn into the life of God. Uh, I think uh, Bishop David, you quoted Irenaeus saying, God became human that we might become divine. Okay, uh, but apart from Irenaeus, Athanasius is another one. Very strongly this theology of Jesus as the one who draws us into God. Greek theology, very strong continued. Over in the West, as Christianity developed, I think we began to lose some of this theology. And I think we began to look much more to the Synoptic Gospels, where the passion, the imagery around the passion, is much more the imagery of atonement. And I think in the West we picked up much more a theology of the meaning of the cross is about making atonement or reparation. 
So that's probably the theology that you and I grew up with and are very familiar with. What I love about John is an alternative New Testament theology of the cross. That it's not so much about atonement for personal sin so much as drawing us into the life of God. Of course, in drawing us into the life of God, we're drawn away from uh, the darkness. We're drawn into the light. But it is a different theology. And I think it's a theology that our church uh, in today's society, today's world, really needs to reclaim. I think it is a, th a gospel, a theology, where there is cause for great joy. That you and I are called to be participants in the very life of God. And that means right now, that's what you and I are living. That eternity life of God. That's why in our Christian church we often use the reading from the book of wisdom at a death where we read, in the eyes of the world they appeared to die but they only appeared to die. Their life lives on in the hands of God. That's what we're living out, people. We are people of the eighth day. A whole new creation. Okay? So Frank's going to take you into uh, the resurrection narrative because it's all very well. Here we are at the cross in chapter 18 and 19. But where are the other disciples? <laughs> They've fled to the hills. <laughs> so they got to come to this faith. And that's the story of chapter 20. So thank you all. Thank you.